You know, I inadvertently read a biography of Margaret Mead, um, and I got to this chapter where she was with her second husband, and they were way up the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea uh, in 1933, and really having a difficult time. And over on, in a different part of the Sepik was another anthropologist named Gregory Bateson, and he was the only other anthropologist that I know of that was in the country at the time. And they met, and they kind of had like a, you know, kind of an explosion of a meeting of the minds. And it, they entered a very complicated and passionate love triangle for about five months because Bates had found them a place to stay, just was a tribe to study. And visited them a lot, and it was a, just a very interesting time in her life, and I, the minute I read that very short chapter, I thought that would make a fabulous novel, but I didn't think it was a novel that I was going to be writing, right. but I was so curious about it, I, I just I kept on going back and reading some more, and reading a little bit more, and then I started taking notes, and, and a couple of years into it, I was writing another novel, but when I was just doing the research, I, I got about four lines for... Uh, the novel, the first four lines, and then it just, once I had those lines, I knew that, that was going to be my next book. Chapter 1. As they were leaving the Mambanyo, someone threw something at them. It bobbed a few yards from the stern of the canoe, a pale brown thing. Another dead baby, Fen said. He had broken her glasses by then, so she didn't know if he was joking. Ahead lay the bright break in the curve of dark green land where the boat would go. She concentrated on that. She did not turn around again. The few Mambanyo on the beach were singing and beating the death gong for them, but she did not look at them a last time. Every now and then, when the four rowers, all standing, calling back to their people or out to other canoes, pulled at the same time, a small gust of wind struck her damp skin. Her lesions prickled and tightened, as if hurrying to heal in the brief, dry air. The wind stopped and started, stopped and started. She could feel the gap between sensation and recognition of it, and knew the fever was coming on again. The rowers ceased rowing to stab a snake-necked turtle and haul it into the boat, still writhing. Behind her, Fen hummed a dirge for the turtle, too low for anyone but her to hear. I don't think it's something that I think about um, consciously when I embark on a novel. I, I think it's tricky for me to intellectualize too much the process. I, I just really wanted to tell the story and I immersed myself in their world at that time, whatever I could find about it. Um, and it is, it has been very interesting to me, to me to finish the book and to realize, oh, right, you know, we are doing this all the time. Look at the New York Times op-eds about how, we, how you should raise children. Yeah. Um, and certainly uh, the, the political issues, human rights issues at the time um, are very, very resonant with what she believed in. And I think really so many of, um, of the issues that we are struggling with and that we have moved forward on, I mean, we are really standing on Margaret's shoulders in a lot of ways because she did have, she was very outspoken and she... She did have a, extremely liberal ideas for, for her time, and for ours. I mean, honestly, she was much more liberal than, than most of us are today, even, even ones who consider themselves very liberal. <laughs> Bet was in the wheelhouse, eating something yellow from a tin. She looked blankly in my direction, hearing the motor, and when she finally recognized it as mine, she ducked through the small door and waved from the bow. I shouldn't have come. If there had been any decent way of wheeling my boat around and heading straight back, I would have done. There had been a husband at one time. They'd, they'd been in engineering school together in London, come here to work on a bridge in Moresby. But by the time the bridge was finished, he'd fled to Adelaide with a girl and Bet signed a contract for a bridge in Angorum and bought this pinnace to get herself there. She's lived on it ever since. I suspected she was close to 40, though we never discussed our age. I cleated my canoe line to her stern and she gave me a hand up. She wore a clean white linen shirt and smelled like lilies, a new smell. You took your time. I just got back this morning. From where? Lake Tam. Hunting? I was a horrible liar, but I said yes. Good hunting up Lake Tam? 
She sensed something, perhaps that I hadn't already taken off all her clothes. I lifted my hand half-heartedly to her blouse. She watched me unbutton it without moving. I liked that. I didn't want her to reach in and find me under-enthusiastic. But as I opened up the shirt and touched her nipples with the tips of my thumbs and felt the weight of her breast in my palms, my body made the shift to this woman, this body, and I felt my determined erection with relief. She never, for this initial welcoming, led me down to her bed, but took me right there, en plein air, around the ropes and tools and storage boxes. She was warm and familiar, and though I wasn't quite myself, eventually I hollered over her shoulder toward the trees, which shook from animals running from the sound. We laughed at a loud, frightened, eee and our chests stuck and unstuck loudly. I believed if I could do that 20 more times, I might be able to flush Nell Stone entirely out of my system. Every single book that I've written, I write by hand first, and I just go out and I get these notebooks um, at Staples. They're normally recycled paper, and I pretty much write chronologically. And I have, when I start a novel, I usually have just a handful of ideas, really. Um, usually have a couple of sentences that I, that I think are going to be at the beginning of the novel and then I, I sort of start in on chapter one and I write quite chronologically. I rarely jump ahead or go back unless I really need to. And so at the end of every notebook I keep, I keep a section for notes. Um, you know, because when I'm writing the first chapter, I'll get an idea for the fourth or the fifth, and I just start compiling notes and ideas, and I just put it all in one place. And then when the notes get too out of control, I um, usually make a timeline. And this this one it had to be a large timeline, uh, and so I, I did that. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but and and basically, they're not chapters. It's not any sort of organized thing. I just start. Um, I just kind of start at the beginning and I have little moments, just little moments that I want to get to. And they're sort of little little markers, little little points. I, I hit one and then I then I just write toward the next and then I write toward the next and um, and then you know I slowly move along. This sort of takes me to the maybe three quarters of the book. And I read I saw this yesterday. I haven't looked into these for a long time, but it says my very last point on this timeline was have some sort of culminating moment. <laughs> That's a good idea, you know. <laughs> I just, you know, it wasn't, it was sort of, it could become, it's clear and then it becomes less and less clear and I just have to work my way uh, toward there. And, um, and then the only other thing about these notebooks that, that, uh, that's important to me is in the very, very last page is my writing log and so I will keep a date and then how many pages I've written. And what's funny is it probably average out, averages out to about one and a half pages or two pages. A five and a half page day or a um, six and a third page day, those are very, very big days for me. Um, most days are, are much um, less productive. But That's I think so it just cool. sort of keeps me honest. Chapter five. My village of Ningay lay 40 river miles west of Angorum. As the crow flies, it would have been half that, but the Sepik, the longest river in New Guinea, is flamboyantly serpentine, the Amazon of the South Pacific, with a tendency to meander to such extremes that it is created, I learned a decade later, under much different circumstances, over 15,000 oxbow lakes, places where the loops bent around so far they broke off. Oh dear. <laughs> But when you are in a dugout canoe at night, even if it is motorized, you are not cognizant of the inefficient zig and zag of your route. You simply feel the river bend one way and then eventually another. You get used to the bugs in your eyes and mouth and the shiny rucked bulges of crocs and the monkeys caterwauling on high branches and the thrash and bustle of thousands of nocturnal creatures gorging themselves while their predators sleep. You do not feel the extra unnecessary 20 miles. If anything, you wish the trip were longer. Okay, that was a little windy disaster. <laughs>